Never has the cycling transfer market been so up in the air as it was this year, with uncertainties over teams and their sponsors and a revised UCI calendar late in the season, deals are still being done just days before the new year, with riders trying to salvage their careers. Other big name deals were done and dusted in the summer, so coming up, we're going to take a look at the biggest moves for 2021. One deal which came very late in the day was for Fabio Aru. The Italian had a season to forget, ninth overall at the Volta Burgos being the standout result. And then later, whilst his teammates at the Tour de France were celebrating four stage wins and the overall classification in Paris, he was at home having failed to finish stage nine. And that was quite the fall from grace for a man who has won the Vuelta and twice finished on the podium at the Giro d'Italia. Now, he was reported to be the sixth highest paid cyclist over the last few years at an estimated 2.6 million euros. I think it's safe to say he'll not be banking that sort of major wedge at his new team, Quebec at Assos, but that's not the point. He is looking to salvage his career and prove he can still climb with the best, whilst the team will be hoping he picks up some big and very cost-effective results. Mark Cavendish was also given a last-minute reprieve, being signed by De Kooning Quickstep at the start of December. Manager Patrick Lefebvre has said that Cavendish will bring his own sponsors to pay his wages. Now, I think at this point, nobody's expecting to see the Cavendish of old. Not him, not us, and not his team. However, I am incredibly pleased that he is now going to be able to finish on his own terms. A rider of his class should not have to end a glittering career with a whimper at the three days of Depana. Whatever he does, he will most certainly still be in the headlines, but I for one hope that he can punch the air in victory at least one last time next season. There is no doubt though that the biggest move of the year was that of Chris Froome. With Team Sky since 2010, his move to the Israel startup nation marks the end of an era. With Ineos brimming with Grand Tour talent, Froome was not guaranteed sole leadership at the Tour de France, and that's what he wanted, and that's what he'll presumably get with his new team. Whether or not leadership will mean results remains to be seen. Froome has not been close to his form of old since that crash at the Criterium du Dauphiné last year. He did seem, though, to be improving as the Vuelta a España progressed. That said, it's hard to see him up there in the mountains of Pogaccia, Roglic, etc. next year. We shall see. It's certainly going to be intriguing. Wilco Kelderman is a rider who has promised so much for so long, but it's just never quite come together for him. It almost did though at this year's Giro d'Italia, but as Almeida faltered, so did he. And so despite spending a couple of days in a pink jersey, he'd ultimately finish on the third step of the podium. Still, that was his best result as a pro rider and should give him and his new team Bora Hansgrohe plenty of confidence going into next year. When Adam Yates was announced as a new signing for Team Ineos, having spent his whole career with Mitch and Scott, it looked like they were interested in grooming the next British Grand Tour winner. However, they ended up doing that sooner than they'd expected with Theo Gegenhardt at the Giro d'Italia. So now they have a bigger quandary than ever. Thomas, Theo, Bernal and Carapaz have all won a Grand Tour. So where will that leave Yates? Super Domestique? Concentrating on one days? Or will he want to be a co-leader at a Grand Tour too? Time will tell, but if Brailsford is to be believed and Ineos focus on attacking rather than defending in 2021, it's going to be very entertaining to watch. Particularly entertaining since they also have signed Danny Martinez. The Colombian made a surprise move over from EF Pro Cycling in an announcement that also included Tom Pidcock and Richie Port. There's only going to be a fourth to be reckoned with in 2021, but once again, what role Martinez plays is unclear. Yes, he won the Criterium du Dauphiné this year and a stage of the Tour de France, but his best GC position in the Grand Tour is 28th at that very race. So it's difficult to see him in a leadership role in Italy, France or Spain next year. Meanwhile, Mike Woods has also left EF Pro Cycling for Pastures New, linking up with Chris Froome at the Israel Startup Nation. 
Woods is now 34 years of age, but as a relative newcomer to the World Tour, he might still have room for improvement. His performances in one-day races is what stood out for me over the last few years, despite his success at La Vuelta, but I thought that he will also be expected to be a key helper for Froome, if he manages to get back to Grand Tour podium form. He will also be joined by Sepp van Mark, who makes the same journey across from EF Pro Cycling, a man who hope he can finally fulfil the promise that he's shown at the Cobble Classics. The boss of the bunch, Mariana Voss, will leave CCC Live after two seasons and head over to the newly created Team Jumbo Visma Women. As she is the standout name in a 12-woman roster and will no doubt play a key role in getting that team off on the right foot. Her experience could prove priceless. Next season is going to be her 16th as a pro rider. Over that time, she's racked up well over 200 wins and that's just on the road, never mind the multitude of other disciplines in which she's also competed and won. 2020 wasn't her best year ever, despite her three-stage wins at the Giro Rosa, but then she was recovering from injury, and I've no doubt she'll want to hit 2021 with a bang in her new Dutch team. Voss is not the only big name to be leaving CCC Live, as the queen of e-racing, Ashley Moorman, is also moving on. She capped off her time at the team by becoming the first cycling eSports world champion, and it was partly her results from indoor racing that got her her contract with SD Works, formerly Bulls Dormans. Now, despite her success on the home trainer, I've no doubt that Mormon will be looking to take some big wins on the road next season for her new team. She's clearly got the talent, but the second half of her season this year was marred by a nasty crash at Strada Bianca. Next up, Michael Matthews is heading home. The Australian will rejoin Mitchton Scott, or Mitchton Bianchi, as we think they'll be known next year, having spent four years at Team Sunweb. Now, he actually had another year on his contract with that team, but after being snubbed for this year's Tour de France, the two parties came to an agreement and he was allowed to move early. With Adam Yates moving on from Mitchelton, I reckon Michael Matthews is going to play a key role in their plans next year. And I also think his best results and years are still ahead of him, despite now being 30 years of age. I can't quite believe, actually, that he's already 30. And so it will be Roman Bardet, who will be the biggest name at Team Sunweb, or Team DSM as it will be known next year. Or maybe it's Mark Hershey. I don't know, but either way, Bardet is heading away from his comfort zone of AG2R, with whom he has spent his entire nine-year career so far. Now, I might have been a bit unfair in saying that he was in his comfort zone at that team, because it can't be easy being a big French GC hope in a French team. And so from that point of view, I've got very high hopes of Bardet at DSM. It will be a completely different culture, but he is the sort of character who I think could flourish in that team environment, even if it's not as a Grand Tour podium contender. Another rider leaving Mitchton Scott after five very successful years is Annemiek van Fleurten. Now, I was surprised to see her move on from that team, but she obviously wanted a fresh start, and so she will spend at least the next two years with Movistar. By the time that two-year contract comes to an end, she will be 40 years old, but despite her age, she is still the woman to beat at most of the races in which she starts. Also heading to Movistar, rather surprisingly, is Miguel Angel Lopez. Now, I say that because at the 2019 Vuelta a España, he was publicly very critical of the team and the way they'd been riding. Anyway, any issues must have been resolved as that is where his home will be next year. And they will be hoping he can pull in the big wins. This year was a torrid one for Movistar with just two wins on the men's team for the entire season, both of them from Marc Soler. Not even the ever-reliable Alejandro Valverde managed to sneak a win. And I wouldn't put it past Lopez nailing a big one. Looking at pro cycling stats, he is incredibly consistent. So he has started eight Grand Tours in his career, and although he didn't finish two of them, on the other six, he's never been outside the top eight on GC. He's also still only 26, so he's got plenty of time to shine. <laughs> 
And finally, we have Greg Van Avermaet, who was forced to find a new team after the demise of Team CCC. So he heads to the AG2R Citroen team with a whole host of non-French riders, including Bob Jungels and Van Avermaet's longtime friend, teammate and domestique, Michael Scher. Now, at 35 years old, you do wonder if Van Avermaet will be able to refine the form that saw him to victory at Paris-Roubaix three years ago. But he has signed a three-year contract with the French team, who look to have a cobbled classics pedigree for next season. Right, those are our top 14 transfers for 2021, but no doubt we've missed some important ones. As ever, you can let us know yours in the comment section below this video. Tell us who you are most looking forward to seeing riding in new colours in 2021. All that leaves me to say is happy Christmas everyone, see you soon.